Hello and welcome to the Dreaming and Doing podcast with me, Nikki Raby. I'm an actor, coach, writer, speaker, podcaster and a mum. And in my coaching work, I work with creatives, personal brands, freelancers and small businesses. In my podcast, I talk about success, but not in a traditional sense. I have conversations with those who have built a business from something they love or who have made a pivot in their career. Also those who have built a brand or a job that maybe didn't exist when they were at school and they found a way to monetize their skills, talents and expertise. I've spoken to loads of incredible people, coaches, designers, journalists, app creators, magazine editors, bloggers, content creators, authors, and all round movers and shakers. I asked the questions that you want to know the answer to. So how they started, about money, saying no, saying yes, pitching, presenting, putting yourself out there even though it terrifies you standing out in a busy online world, growing, scaling and making your work work for you and your circumstances. The show notes are always at nikkiraby.com forward slash podcast and the conversation continues across social media, often on Instagram, my favourite platform, at Nikki Raby. Thanks so much for listening. It's great to have you with us. In today's episode, I'm talking to Felicity Jackson, who is the founder of Surviving Actors Limited, an annual industry convention held in London, LA and New York, aimed at jobbing actors looking to develop, sustain and create opportunities within their career. This is so needed because as a young actor myself, I spent a lot of time wandering around with an A to Z. We didn't really have the internet either, and I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes in the early years. I wanted to talk to Felicity because since launching Surviving Actors, she's gone on and founded another company and also a contact for a huge company called Star Now for casting professionals. She's really somebody who I look to because she has that ability to really dream big to go for what it is that she wants and also has two young kids either side of my little boy and has another one on the way so she's a real inspiration to me and she's somebody I love to bounce ideas around with because she has a real can-do attitude. I know you'll get lots from this episode. If you want to join in the conversation, please come over to Instagram at Nikki Raby, or you can also find all the show notes on the podcast page on my website, NikkiRaby.com. Exciting things coming in the autumn for my coaching packages. So have a look on my coaching page. You may be at a point where you need a bit of help with pricing or moving forward or going to the next level, making your career work around your lifestyle all of that kind of good stuff. Have a look. There's loads of testimonials and ways in which I work. So see what you think. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's get into the episode. Hi, Felicity. How are you? Hi, Nikki. I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. Welcome to the podcast. Can you just start by like introducing yourself and tell us a bit more about you and your business? Yes. Um, so my name's Felicity and I have uh, three small businesses called Surviving Actors, Act Pro Expo and Casting Days, which are all um, businesses which are within the arts and support actors. Wow. And how, and also you've got two kids as well, so and life is busy. <laughs> yeah, two children and one on the way. Houses. Not that <laughs> these kids busy. make any money. <laughs> It's about time they did a decent amount of work. Um, so how did your um, entrepreneurial journey start? Okay, so my first step was Surviving Actors. So that's my original business. And it basically started where I was doing some promo at a Freshers Fair for a discount card. And I was selling these cards to students where they'd get a discount for their student years. And I was looking around and I was thinking, ha, huh, this would actually be quite cool for actors to have some sort of fresh freshers fair. Mm. Um, so I, I didn't really come up with the idea of a business. I just came up with the idea of an event. So I 
booked a venue for my first event and then literally just got on the phone and started selling booths for it because it was a, a trade show. So yeah, that's where it started really. It kind of just started with the idea of an event and then from there it sort of escalated. Oh, and it's escalated to huge proportions now. <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's wild. I've, you know, I've spoken at them and also yeah. attended them as well. And it's just, it's, you're the leading people in your field. It's amazing. And so needed for actors. Cause basically I was sent out of drama school with an A to Z and a chocolate bar and good yeah. luck. <laughs> <laughs> Get yourself out there. Um, let's go back on sort of like, getting people to invest in your idea because I think it's because you were really young when you started as well I think sometimes we can feel like there's one thing sort of sitting around the dining room table with you know your parents or um you know brothers or sisters or mates over a couple of glasses of wine but actually taking that from I kind of think that I could do this to actually doing it. How did you do that? And how did you get people to, well, how did you convince them, I guess? How did you get people on board? Yeah, so I think that my age was one of the best things about it because I was fearless and I was ringing people without a website, um, without a proper email address, just with a Hotmail account. And I had one Hotmail account for me and then one for my fake secretary <laughs> that I used to email from as well, just so that people would think... very that, busy. It was, yeah, because I'm so busy. Um, and... I would send a small amount of emails, but I was basically just phone bashing, um, ringing companies, telling them about the event. And I, yeah, I think I just, I think I, I just targeted as many companies as I could that I thought would be the right type and the right fit for the event. Yeah. Uh, I didn't try to make money on the first event. We actually did break even, which was great, but I didn't try to kind of make a massive profit. I just wanted to put on a really good event and see whether or not it could be something. Yes. Um, But I think my age was the best thing because I I signed a contract on the venue and I had about 50p in my account. So I don't know what my plan was if I hadn't have sold any stands. Like the biggest party of all time for you. (laughs) Come to this hotel conference room, guys. It will be fine. Um, And I think that as you get older, the fear can take over a lot more. Totally. Um, I was just going to ask, actually, how do you... How do you cold call people? And it's such an obvious thing, but I think lots of people have that um, real fear that somebody's immediately going to say, no, bog off and, you know, or kind of tell them off or something for phoning. Or I I guess there are some people that can take all day plucking up the courage to make a phone call. How, How do you sell that idea in the limited amount of time that you have? Yes, I think um, I think cold calls can be really difficult. I think um, making sure that you've got a really good pitch, which is really quick and easy to understand. Yeah. And then also mimicking the person on the phone. So if they are mega, mega fast talking, then you need to match that tone and be mega, mega fast talking. And if they're Mr. Chill on the phone and they're, they're super relaxed, then to kind of have that relaxed vibe as well. Um, I try not to say, is this a good time to talk? Because it's just a really easy get out for them. Yeah. They always say no. <laughs> um, but if if I find that they're being a bit rude on the phone or a bit um, standoffish, then I'll say to them, is there a better time that I could call you back? Um, but I try my best just to get to go straight in with the conversation because I think that the worst thing you can say on a cold call is, is this a good time to talk? Because yeah. when people call me, you know, from O2 or wherever, and they say, is this is a good time to talk? I'm like, oh, no, no, no. it's not at all. <laughs> yeah, because what are you selling me? What do you need yeah. from me? And um, yeah. And then I often give them a time that I know I can't pick up the phone so that it, it will just go to voice now. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm available um, at 4 a.m. Um, yes. Do call me and we'll have a chat maybe at some point. There's so many times when I've been cold called and um, they've just got on with it. I've actually gone with whatever offer they've given me because they haven't given me a doubt. Um, 
So, yeah, I think kind of having a really quick pitch, mimicking the person that you speak to so that they can identify with you a bit more and trying to just get on with it and not give them an out by saying, is now a good time to talk? Definitely. Um, How have you grown so quickly? Um, Because, you know, I think sometimes we can have this feeling that to build a successful business takes 50 years and then you're sitting in your, you know, velvet chair looking out at the ocean and then you have these kind of conversations. But, you know, you've made huge progress and also been able to open other companies and things like that. How have you done that? What sort of tools have really um, accelerated you? I think that when I first set up I wasn't scared to do lots of other jobs to keep paying the bills yeah so I'd do a lot of promo I'd be flyering um, in the evenings and in my bedroom on the phone working on the business during the day so it wasn't where I kind of had a, a feeling like, oh, I now run a business, so I, I couldn't possibly work in a bar or I couldn't possibly do flyering. Again, age helps with that as well. Yeah. Um, and I also think that I have um, made some good choices with I, – I hired somebody who was really great for the business about two years in – Uh, which was brilliant and she's been um, such a huge part of the success and so meeting her and going with my gut Mm. about um, you know making an investment in having somebody to help me was was a was really great as well so not being greedy with the money so not being like you know when we start making a profit oh I I don't want to hire anyone because I just want to keep all the profit for myself yes but um, actually hiring somebody and which worked out really well, was um, a huge part of the success. How did you know when it was the right time to hire? Because I think I know when I've had people who have worked with me, I waited way too long. I waited until that moment when I was, you know, sobbing or sitting on the living room floor and kind of having a toddler moment and Matt having to go, okay, right, you need to sit on the sofa and you need to do this. Because I think this is the thing, especially if it's your idea and it's your baby to a certain extent, you know how to do everything. It can be quite hard to let go. Oh, totally. The letting go bit was so difficult. I can still remember her first phone call to somebody and I just sat there like my toes were (laughs) scrunching up and I had to stop myself because it it would be very rude for me to kind of be whispering and writing bits on a paper and (laughs) kind of just had to to make sure she says. Oh, Um, totally. And so, yeah, the letting go bit was really, really difficult. And before she came on board, I genuinely believed that People were buying into the business for me and it was all about me. But then when I hired her and I realized that people were still booking stands and still getting involved, I was like, huh, okay, this is bigger than me. Um, It's not just that people like me and so they're buying a stand. They actually do want to do the event. Interesting, Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think that that was – yeah, that, that was really hard to let go, but really important to let go as well. And and she brought some totally different skills to what I had, which was brilliant. Um, and so, you know, and there's lots of things that she's better at me with and things that I'm better than her with. So it was, you know, it's a good relationship. And um, knowing when to hire somebody was uh I mean there just wasn't ever really a right time at all and I I wasn't really sure how I was going to pay her but um I just kind of took a punt and went for it um again probably just being young and young and naive um and not worrying too much about how I'm going to pay all the invoices at the end of the month (laughs) Yeah, quite. And sometimes I think that's the thing that you have to be able to um, pivot, as Ross from Friends would say. (laughs) But I've had moments suddenly where I've had to, even though I'm a huge fan of goal setting because I'm a coach, sometimes you have to go with the flow a little bit and go, I've got to switch focus here. My attention needs to be elsewhere. And otherwise, if I don't, this opportunity is going to be swept away from me. Or when sometimes people say, can I have this over to to me by the end of the day? And you're thinking, 
oh, but I've actually figured out what I'm doing this afternoon. Sometimes you just have to go for it and not be too connected to it, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I think letting go of things which you've worked out, they're working, you you know, if somebody else can take over, gives you the time and the brain space to be able to think about the next move. Yes. And think about the bigger picture and being too bogged down in the just the constant logistics and running of the business is not always the best thing because it just you, you can't always have that kind of bigger overview no and I think that kind of clarity of thought like we were just talking before we came on the the call like I go uh, you know I've danced a lot in my life but I haven't really exercised you know in depth recently and I went for a walk slash bit of a slow jog this morning and um it's just given me so like my brain works and not that it doesn't usually but I can just feel the difference and I think um just having that it's not necessarily the number of hours that you spend sitting at your laptop that brings the most productive version of you yeah oh absolutely I've definitely learned that since having children I can't believe I used to work five days a week full time I I, I don't know what I was doing with all those hours <laughs> because I, I generally like I, I, I think back and I'm like how did how what was I doing with all of that time Whereas now I have such a smaller amount of time because I, I only work when I have childcare. So I have such a smaller amount of time that I'm so much more productive. And it's not about whether or not I have 12 hours or six hours. It's just about what I'm getting done. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I totally agree. It's not about the hours that you put in at all. It's about being productive and, and just getting on with it. And just having that focus of like, is this going to make me money? And I said it on the podcast before that when I was pregnant, I thought future proofing my business during pregnancy was making sure everything was lined up on my website and like tweaking the font or making a new version of graphics or whatever. And it's just like, it really isn't because nobody's ever said, God, I love the way that you've left that spacing between paragraphs. <laughs> Nobody's ever said it. Nobody's interested. Yeah, no. um, how how do you go about logistically at, without losing your mind of actually putting on an event of those kind of scales? So if people haven't come before, can you just describe it a little bit of what it actually looks like? Um, and maybe if you could do it in an X Factor voice, that would be <laughs> five rooms, four thousand people. Yeah, what does it um, what does it look like? It's a five-star hotel, <laughs> two and a half thousand people. No. Um, and all so the speakers we, come in in helicopters. Can we do that next year? <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, so where we're at now, which we've been at that venue for the last five years. Um, so we use a hotel in Marlebone and we have around two and a half thousand people that attend the expo. We have 45 exhibitors, which are all in the ballroom. And then on the same floor, there are four different rooms, breakout rooms, which are used for seminars and workshops. And then we have four different, um, much smaller rooms that we use for open castings and uh, career mentors. So it's it's basically a... um, you know, a, a huge space is free for access to attend um, the event. And it's basically a huge space for actors to meet with companies that can support their careers and network with other people and industry professionals and all of those kind of things. Wow. So that, that's what it is. And how do you, how do you, what's your first, I mean, I guess it's a tried and tested method now. So you're sort of not starting from scratch. You're, you, you know, you when you sit down at the beginning of planning the next one, you're not, you're sort of saying, well, we're never doing that again, or we need more of this or whatever. Yeah. And I think I speak to so many women who, you know, we are in this brilliant time of conversation about let's get more women um, into work, on boards, having conversation, really lifting each other up. Up. and um, a lot of people I speak to they just say oh, I would love to have like a group of women who meet up or like put on, a, on an event how what's the first thing that you need to do in order to actually make that work 
Well, I think that it really helps if you are putting on something for people that you really know. So, Mm. I mean, I trained at drama school and I, so I trained as an actress. The girl that I hired is an actress. And so that world of actors, we just really know. Um, And people have said to me loads of times like, oh, why didn't you do an event for this field or that field? (laughs) And I'm like, I just don't it's not my world I don't know them and I'm sure I would be making about a hundred times more money if I did Mm. not work in the field that I work in yes um because it's the arts and we're tapping into marketing budgets so it's literally the worst of both worlds but um it's our world and that's what we know and so when it comes to booking speakers and organizing the program and exhibitors you know that's there are people we know who we're talking to we know what they want um so I think knowing knowing the audience and knowing what they're going to want is really really important um but it, it is it is a difficult one it's 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 difficult to balance what people want in terms of the visitors versus also being able to um make a profit and financially be able to make it work as well Um, because sometimes we get you know really great emails from actors after the events with constructive feedback about things that they they wish that we we could do um and we wish we could do those things as well you know but it's you know if they could give us a a nice sponsor that could help with that then that we we could do it but you know it's it's about getting a balance between making sure people are happy with attending the event and putting on something really useful but also making sure that our exhibitors and our sponsors are happy as well and just making sure that you're kind of balancing both worlds yes how has it changed in terms of your business life since having kids because I remember speaking at an event and I think you just had your eldest so you were at that point of going so the event's booked so I kind of have to be here but also I've just had the baby so let's like go with this how did you how do you get your head around that um so I think that the uh, the week of the events is prob- is is quite difficult um with children and to be honest with you i think as soon as why i found having my second easier was because i i, I had a like a good setup with childcare yeah. and i trusted our nanny and i trusted the nursery that my eldest was at so all of that was already set up um so i think just having having a good plan in mm-hmm. place of who is picking who up at what time um, and, yes. you know, ha- who's looking after what child. And sometimes, you know, with with the um, with childcare, if I, I, you know, I know people who I think, oh, they're a bit flaky. And so I'm like, right, I'm not going to ask them. I'm just going to pay for an ad hoc day at nursery because, yeah. you know, I know that they're not going to cancel on me. I know that they can go there from eight till six and I know they're going to be happy. So, yes. you know, so sometimes just throwing a bit of money at the situation um, to make the event easier helps. Um, but yeah, it is, it is hard. I, uh, on, I think it was last year. Um, actually, no, sorry. It might've been the year before I was at the event and I was breastfeeding and at the end of the event, people kept giving me hugs Oh. and it was like I hadn't fed all day <laughs> and I I told myself I'd pump I didn't um and it was literally like people were cuddling me saying like oh thank you for everything bye oh god oh, that's so every, painful every time and I was thinking if one more person hugs me I'm going to literally burst on them um <laughs> oh god I remember yeah going to a wedding and sort of yeah again it's in a marquee in the middle of nowhere so there was no sort of option and then of course all those like and I, I don't think I'd been drinking lot, or I was maybe like just done by nine o'clock or something yeah. and then all those music um, those tunes come on where everybody wants to have their arms around you doing yeah we gotta hold on to what <laughs> and I'm going please don't squeeze me what are you doing but um yeah I think I had to have a cry at some point I'm sure of it in fact um and how have you broken out into international um markets and um 
uh, sort of worked out those logistics of growing the business on an international level? Yeah, so um, so with Surviving Actors, the event, we decided that we wanted to do it in New York because we decided they speak to go shopping. <laughs> yeah, we were like, they speak English. It would be a great place to go every year. Yeah. Uh, and we we felt like culturally New Yorkers and Londoners had a lot in common. And we also felt like New York people would, could walk. Mm. Whereas with LA, we were we were a bit kind of, uh, had no idea where we, we'd even do it. So um, we went for New York. And to be honest with you, the first, our first step was we just went there for a week to do like a recce and we just had loads of meetings with people and it was all a bit of a dream at that point it was kind of like oh we could possibly do an event in New York and then we sat on the flight on the way home from New York really excited and we were like yes we are we're going to do this this is this you know we definitely think it will work over there um so the, our first step was a recce, which was great fun, mm. um, where we met with so many people, um, and it was really easy to get meetings. People were so responsive, um, and we just came back with like n- loads and loads of notes of what people would want. At the time, there was another event which was really similar, which was on called Actor Fest, which was run by a very big company called Backstage. Um, and so people knew what we were talking about and so that's why I always say like competitors are not a bad thing because it means that people already kind of know what what you're offering yes Uh, and even though you don't want to say to them oh it's the same as Active Fest because it's not the same at all but when you say it's a trade show it's an expo they're going to know what you're talking about um and so, yeah, so we went and did that trip. and But what we didn't do on that trip was find a venue. So we're on the flight on the way home and we're like, oh, this is the you thing we're going to do it. And then we're like, we haven't got a venue. Yeah. Oh, no. So we literally got home and uh, booked another flight for uh, uh, the next month and went back again. Wow. Um, and found a venue. Uh, so, yeah, it was it was one of those things where we were like this that was so stupid but oh oh well that was pre-children so you know we got two trips to New York um and so yeah we we again that was all a bit um you know actually the logistics of doing business in America um has been quite difficult because I was I basically worked all out by myself using Google in terms of how to set up an LLC and um, how to do tax returns over there and all of that kind of thing. So that was quite difficult and there was quite a lot of red tape. Um, And by the time we did our first event, I wasn't, uh, I I wasn't legally, I wasn't legal to do anything over there. Mm. Um, but I did get, uh, I did have with me at the event because I decided that there was going to be like police or something that would turn up and tell me off, which obviously didn't happen. <laughs> but I had a folder with kind of everything that I'd done to to set the business up and all of the hurdles that I was waiting to hear back from people about and all of the registration that I was trying to do. So I, I had all of that with me and I just decided that if anybody came and told me off, I'd have all of that and it would show intention and hopefully I would get away with it. Um, and then a few months later, I'd kind of got everything, all my ducks in a row and I'd found an accountant and I'd registered as an LLC and I'd done all of the things that I thought were right um so yeah it was it just uh, in terms of the business it was quite um it was quite hard work to get over all the red tape um but in terms of actually running the event it was really similar to London so that wasn't too difficult 
and certainly certainly about the way that you talk about it it's very in terms of like going we've done this in London and we'd like to do it here having that tried and tested um, method of like we've actually cracked it here and then we'll move on to the same thing I think that's a really valid point because sometimes everybody's trying to do all the things at uh, the same time and you know like when you play Ludo you've almost got to get one of the little counters moving and shaking (laughs) before you because if if they're all just sort of hanging around on and not growing and not moving forward you're just not building that momentum for yourself yeah absolutely you look at a lot of event companies and there seems to be two types there's event companies that do a variety of different events usually in the same area whether that's London or UK or you have a, event companies that have an event and then do it in multiple different cities. Mm. Um, and I remember really making that choice um, where I was like, am I going to do more events in London of for different um, industries or am I going to have this event and then move it around to different locations? And I don't know if I made the right choice. You know, I could be sat here if I decided to do multiple events in London for different industries and that could have worked. But for some reason, it just felt right to do my event and do it in different locations and um, to to bring our expertise. And culturally, everywhere is different. So you, you can't do exactly the same thing. Um, but it, we, we found that it is we, we, we quite enjoy the way that we're doing it. Yeah, and I think that you that giving yourself permission to just try it and go for it. And if you like draw a line under doing it once and you go, Oh, we're not gonna do that again, that's okay as well. That you always you always get rewarded for making some choices and moving forward and branching out. Oh, absolutely. You know, we we've definitely made mistakes and we've put, we've tried things that haven't worked. Um, you know, I, I could list them all out, you know, so we've definitely tried things and they haven't worked. And I've looked at those things and thought, OK, tried it, didn't work, move yeah. on. Um, and so, yeah, it would be I, 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 I think it's very rare that you meet anybody that everything that they've tried with their business has worked. Um, oh, but obviously totally. the things that you can find online and you read about are usually the things that have worked. But behind that are a million other things that haven't worked. Oh, and a lot of ugly cries and moments of going, oh, I just don't know. Or, you know, yeah, yeah all huge, absolute humdingers of mistakes. And um, yeah, but you always gain, I mean, I, I guess it sounds a bit self-development to go, there's always a lesson, you know, but <laughs> I, I really think think there is and sometimes just by thinking about stuff you actually don't learn the lesson you have to do it and then go okay that's what it feels like and this is why yeah and all of that um in terms of your because like me you trained as an actor how what's really helped your your own business journey and that sort of the fact that you're not saying like oh I you're not there's never anything sort of apologetic about you of sort of like oh I was this and now I'm doing that you know I've always known you in that business capacity what's really helped you move forward well my my drama school training was really brilliant for everything that I do and I found that the skills have been really transferable I pretty much realized in my second year of drama school that I didn't think I was going to be an actor and I was in a black cab and I was feeling a bit down about everything and I obviously told the driver all of my woes <laughs> um, and the drive and I was like 19 at the time and the driver told me that he trained at RADA oh and I was like oh really and he was like yeah, I trained at Raja. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. It was brilliant, blah, blah, blah. And then told me all about his life. And he'd done all of these really cool things. And he'd never been an actor. So I was like, oh, did you do the whole your whole course? And he was like, yeah, yeah, of course. And I was like, oh, okay, so I can do this whole course and then not go on to be an actress. Okay. 
I'm going to be a cabbie. Yeah. (laughs) And um, yeah, it was a really, really good cab journey. And I I, I wish I could find that man and and tell him that um, he really, he stopped me from kind of dropping out. And I I found that the skills that I learned at drama school have been so transferable, um, massively in terms of dealing with a a variety of different Mm -hmm. types of people. Um, the, the act, you know, acting and sales go hand in hand. So that is, um, you know, that's worked really well. Um, improvisation has been brilliant because being able to improvise on the phone when somebody asks you a difficult question, um, or face to face at the event. And, you know, so all of those things I found really useful. And, you know, I, I, people always say to me, Oh, would you want the, your children to go to drama school? And I'm like, well, no, I don't really want them to go down the route of being an actor. But if they really wanted to, then, of course, I would encourage them. Because at the end of the day, just because you go to drama school doesn't mean that you have to be an actor. No. no. And also, if I my mum had said, do you know what? I think uh, that maybe this is not the thing. Like at 17, yeah. 18, or even like four or five, there, there was really no stopping me. I mean, they only had one rule that I wasn't allowed to go uh, um 16 which is what I wanted to do I wanted to to leave home and they um, even my dad said I loved his logic like you can't even get into a pub and I was like well turns out dad I have been going into pubs for a little (laughs) while and it's not stopped me up until this point but I think they had that terror of like oh my goodness they're 16 year old living in London it felt like you know too early but I think sometimes if you know that you've got that path that it always or that passion for something it always comes back around in a weird and wonderful way and I have it with coaching clients sometimes where maybe somebody restricted them at an early stage and now they go why did I do that or why did I choose this path when actually I should have gone down this route yeah absolutely I think when I was doing my A-levels my classics teacher was so passionate and I used to think to myself I, I, I hate classics and I'd hate to be a teacher, but I, whatever I do, I really want to be as passionate about it as she is mm. and, you know, enjoy myself as much as that. And that has definitely been something that I've kind of taken with me. And I've had loads of ideas for the business um, of things that I could do that w- might bring in loads of money. But I think, oh, gosh, I wouldn't want to do that, though. And, I, you know, that, that would be that, uh, the actual logistics of doing that is something that I wouldn't want to do. And I would find really uh, like just a job that I wouldn't want. Yes. You, you know, so I think being really passionate about whatever you're doing is so much more important than just making money. Yeah, and something just feel feeling good for now, but almost always that sort of long term vision as well. That what you don't want to do is close too many doors off and uh, early on. And you know, I moved to London in two thousand, and it was the same year that Big Brother launched. And oh, I did know somebody actually that. Um, sort of wasn't an actor but wanted to be and we were working in a clothes shop together in Oxford Street and he got down to the last few or was recalled to go on Big Brother and there was a part of me that was like oh at that time of reality stars maybe that would be the easy way to do it but I was like hang about you know I like getting drunk in private with my friends and family (laughs) I don't want to be in a hot tub with some dude or girl that I've like I don't know I just don't want to put myself in that situation where I'm like I'm having a great time and the 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 country is watching and I think when you're self-employed you do have the choice of what you what your next move is and what you do with your own career and that is something that I'm really grateful for and that I really relish and I don't want to take that away from myself so being able for me to choose what I do next and I want to make money of course but I also want to be really happy and to really enjoy what I do yeah Um, and so and for me they are both equally as important absolutely and you know just be really in control and build a business that works for you as well it's sometimes you know I I, I, at this stage of the game even when people say I'll do it do a year-long coaching program or run a monthly Facebook group and for me I just I don't have 
I, I don't want to do it because I feel like it would limit me. And also there's there's different ways in which I can work. And I think always going back to what do I want? What am I trying to get from this business? It just helps you sort of feel really clear about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So finally, where would you like to be in five years time in in business and in life? I mean, you're going to have like three under tens by this point, aren't you? Yeah, uh, yeah. Five years, I'll have three under eight. Wowzers! Um, so well, you I, need to keep working because you'll need to feed them. Because yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to be able to be feeding the children. Yeah, and they eat so much at the moment. Like that thing of like, can I have a snack? It's like oh, you've literally just eaten two minutes ago. What do yeah. you do now? I mean, my my son for breakfast is a monster. <laughs> this morning he had. Over the course of about an hour and a half, he had seven Weetabix. Wow, good lad. And he, he's he's like a bean pole as well. I don't know where he puts it all. And he's like, I'm hungry though, I'm hungry. So I just think, oh, okay, maybe he's hungry. I mean, it, it, yeah, he eats a lot, especially I've got two boys. If I have another boy and they all have an appetite like him, then, yeah, I'm going to need to do some extra hours. <laughs> I was saying that to someone the other day, that, like, where my mum used to do a shop, my brother would just take the the chunk of cheese that she'd purchased and, like, start hacking at it. And my mum was like, oh, that's sort of for everybody for the week. This, this is not like a one meal situation. But, yeah, we always had a very open house and uh, my brother would always rock up with two or three friends. So I'm sure my mum was feeding half the village. so yeah in five years I would so one thing which I I really want to be able to do is the school drop off and pick up yeah to be able to have the business at the point where I can work five days a week nine till three that's really important to me and I've basically I didn't take much maternity leave at all and I've basically been building the business to get to the point where I can do a nine till three mm. role so that I can do that drop off and pick up. So that's really important to me. Um, I want to, I'd love to be able to be doing a bit less of the menial tasks, which I seem to get myself bogged down <laughs> with now. Yes. Um, so I'd love to be able to be bringing in a bit more money in order to hire. I, I feel like I just need one more person. Although yeah. I spoke to someone recently that said you always feel like you need one more person. Um, yeah. So and then yeah. on the days where you're just like chasing your tail or things are crazy busy, yeah. you're like oh, actually I need fourteen more people yeah. because this is madness. Yeah. So I'd love to, in five years' time to have hired one more person who is. Um, doing uh doing some of the tasks that I'm doing at the moment which would be great and then I would love to have possibly gone into more cities with our event would be great um but we'll see we'll see what happens so exciting and how are you sort of preparing for the next bubba and sort of have you have you thought about kind of how you're you're going to work it I, I kind of ask because I think sometimes as well with certainly with Instagram and things there's this pressure to go so I've had the baby and this is day five and I actually stopped following somebody the other day because she was going to somewhere fancy like a business situation on like day three and I just thought I can't like it was obviously a trigger in me because I was like it took me a long time to feel vaguely normal and maybe I'm still not quite there yet (laughs) yeah do you know what I think it's really it's really because I didn't I haven't really taken maternity leave with my two children and it's been um it's really difficult because some people are have a reaction where they're a bit like oh wow you must be like a super mom how could you do that but that actually makes me feel really bad because I'm like um well and then I start um kind of apologizing for it where I'm like well you know I did um you know I I I did work from home and I I did have somebody come and help and you know and, and and everybody's situation is just completely different. And totally. Well, I was the same. You know, I did a talk at a top university um, when Oscar was three weeks old. And there was part of me going, 
oh my goodness, this like feels a bit crazy. But also I know that my work really lights me up and I yeah. I love it. And also there's not really an option for me not to work as well. You know, it's yeah. sort of, I, things, emails still keep coming through. Things keep happening. You know, my business keeps moving. So I can't just say, oh, see you guys. I'll see you in a couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. And someone made a comment to me once, which really pissed me off, where they basically said, do you think it would have been better to have children when you got your business to a point where you didn't need to be doing so much? Wow. And I was like, no, because my, I, I, I wouldn't want to put having children on hold for that because who knows if that would ever happen. And actually having children has pushed me so much more within my business to make it a success and to, to do all of that, that, that's been that's been an important part of it um so you know for me I I I I always do things way too early so I I always do things roughly a year before I'm probably ready to actually (laughs) do it that's kind of my thing in business with children everything um and doing it before you're ready for me has always worked (laughs) I think you're so right, though, because I feel like it, when people, and I'm sure it's probably her own parameters of how she works, when people say, when I've lost that half a stone, that pesky half a stone that's yeah. always lurking around, I'll do my photo shoot, or yeah. when I feel like I've got another couple of credits, or until I've got so many subscribers, or whatever, and it's just, one thing I've really learned is that once you put your mindset in place, so whether it's, you know, making an an investment and you need some money to come your way once you set an intention and this is not a woo-woo thing this is like okay how do I actually make this happen it happens really quickly when you're not vague anymore yes it's so true and my husband has a commission-based job and he is um he'll always like the other day we've needed a log burner for ages and he ordered this log burner and I was like okay are we gonna be all right for that and he was like yeah once it's ordered I know I'll get a deal in yeah (laughs) that's such a good way to kind of be because he was like yeah let's get it ordered and then I'll definitely get the deal in and I know what he's like he'll make it happen and it and and it will work um because he he definitely has that mindset where he's like you've got to you've got to put yourself in you know not obviously ridiculous situations (laughs) you've got to sell one of the kids (laughs) yeah (laughs) You need to put yourself out there a bit, put yourself under a bit of pressure to make things happen. Um, yeah, because otherwise and, there's so many potential distractions of, oh, I'll do it next week, or this is like taking my time, and actually you've got to get the wheels in motion. Yeah, absolutely, and and that does work for some people. You know, I've got I've got loads of friends who um, are much more kind of level headed than me, and probably make very um, stable life choices about kind of when they do things and that really works for them and and that's great Um, but for me it it really works to kind of just go with my gut and just do something and then make up a plan afterwards. Um, Sounds good yeah so So when's the log burner coming? (laughs) (laughs) Oh god knows I think in a couple of weeks I mean it's a heat wave in July (laughs) apparently we're discussing log burners. I was gonna say yeah snuggle up get your fleecy jimmy jams on and it'll be great. So yeah god knows he he, yeah that's that's something that I'm just leaving to him. Yeah it is one of those things where you're like no can't really discuss this this will be fine um because they want to chat don't they these men after they've had kids they want to chat about everything because I guess (laughs) that's what you do about pregnancy it's like no no you can just make the decision and yeah uh, yeah go forward (laughs) um if people want to find out more about surviving actors and all the other businesses and things that you have where should they go well my websites are survivingactors.com actorsproexpo.com and castingdays.com and we're also on all of the social media instagram facebook twitter so yeah they're the, probably the best places brilliant excellent and also as well if you're listening to to this and you feel like you could be a sponsor or you know you want to get involved in the event like get in touch with felicity there could be a beautiful partnership cooking 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Felicity needs a log burner. Quick, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Someone get me a sponsorship deal. <laughs> I need a kitchen island. I need this. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, write your wish list. I've, I've started doing that, actually, going, I, I know the perfect leather jacket that I want to buy, but it's quite a chunky investment. So I'm just like, no, I'm going to leave it there. And then when that next thing comes in, then, you know, it will be a little treat for... For Nikki, that would be nice. Leather jacket is a great investment. Yes, and it's wipe clean, and I'm talking with children there, so yeah. there we go. <laughs> That's a story for another time. Anyway, thank you so much for being on the podcast, and um, I you. will speak to you soon. Thanks so great. much. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and I would love to hear what you thought of the episode and share any takeaways with me. Come and find me across social media at Nikki Raby or you can visit the podcast page nikkiraby.com forward slash podcast.